three, two, now live. Hello, you guys. Welcome to Tuesday Tips. We are here back. We try to be here every Tuesday afternoon to discuss different topics in plastic surgery, and I get to answer your questions. Thank you, all you guys that join every week. Uh, and thank you for all you guys that tell me that this is helpful and that you like and you enjoy this live. So that's why I return every Tuesday to join and to try to educate and bring bring some some light and some topics that usually cause stress or or doubt. So I started the series a couple of weeks ago. It's called What to Expect. And I'm talking about different procedures in plastic surgery. I've done already mommy makeovers. I've done BBL. So if you're interested in the what to expect those, you can uh, check in my Instagram or YouTube and you can find those videos. But today we're going to dedicate this time to talk about breast procedures, what to expect breast procedures. And I'll, and this is going to be an intro introduction to breast breast procedures. We can be talking about hours of breast implants and all, all things. So, the, this time is going to be focused on the what to expect series. The what to expect series is tailored to talking about the things that patients usually experience, but no one really talks about, but it's a common thing that I hear back and back shared between patients that had breast procedures and now they experience different things. And I'll explain what are those things and why do they experience that and also um, why it's happening, but also what, what to expect in terms of how long will you experience this for um, and what is the end result there, okay? So breast procedures, um, it's basically three main big umbrellas, okay? One is breast augmentation, the other one is breast lift, and the third one is breast reduction, okay? Those are the three main categories that I'll be talking about today. Breast augmentation, breast implants, right? It's like we're not doing big incisions, it's just a small incision, I'm putting an implant in. A breast lift in when you have droopy breast and you have to lift the, the breast, reshape the breast and lift the nipple position. And breast lift can add or not add an implant, that depends on the patient's goals and the anatomy. And a breast reduction is for patients that have large breasts and they have neck pain, shoulder pain. Thank you, Willie, for the light. Um, neck pain, shoulder pain, uh, and it want to, their breasts to be small. A breast reduction does include a lift. I had that question a couple, um, I think it was last week. Uh, it is a very good question. But yes, a breast reduction in group includes a breast lift. So lifting the nipple position and reshaping the breast. So what to expect from a breast procedure? Number one, let's talk about shape and volume. So one, the shape changes a lot after you get a breast procedure throughout the recovery time, okay? So at first, especially with implants, it happens too when you get a breast lift or a breast reduction, the breasts tend to look very high. So it's like people are like, patients are telling me, I feel that my breasts are in my neck. So everything is so tight that the implants tend to look very high or the breast tissue itself, okay? That drops with time, so the shape is going to change. And sometimes people ask me, especially with a breast lift, breast reduction, the most common one is an anchor type, so it's gonna be an incision around the nipple, down and across in the fold. And this type of lift, because this brings everything together here in the center, lift the nipple position and then reshapes the breast to make it round. Sometimes this at the bottom of the breast makes it look flat. So at first, instead of look like this, it may look a little boxy with the incision here or a little bit on the side view like this, kind of tight and the nipple position here. That all rounds up and settles with time, okay? So don't be scared if initially you see that your breasts look boxy or the breast looks tight or flat in the bottom. That shape 100% 100% changes, okay? Once the, the scar settles, the breast tissue settles, it rounds, and I've never seen a long-term boxy breast lift, breast reduction, okay? Uh, so don't worry about that. Volume wise, so volume, a lot of a lot of patients come in and say, I just want to be a D cup or I just want to be a C cup, okay? Unfortunately, breast implants or a breast lift breast reduction, the, I, I don't put I, I don't put a mold of a cup size and I can't make it that way. One because I can put 
10 people right in front of me, all being 34C. Every single one of them, 10 patients that are 34C. And I bet that all those 10 patients, the breasts look completely different, okay? A cup size is, it's a marketing thing, okay? And depending on the brand, depending on the, the store that you shop, the cup sizes, and, and you probably have experienced this, you are a 34C in one and a 34D in another one because the brands are different, the shape of the of the cup of the of the bra itself is different. So it's it's very hard and actually inaccurate to describe a breast in a cup size. Okay, so how do we describe it? A breast lift, breast reduction. I remove weight of breast, so I measure it in grams. And the cup sizes, um, sorry, the breast implant come in cc's, okay? And cc's or milliliters is equivalent to grams, okay? So when I'm measuring a breast implant, for example, a patient has a saline implant, they don't know how much it has inside, inside I remove it and I weigh that. And that's equivalent, the grams to the cc's. And now I can do the math and see how much grams I need to remove to kind of match that up or add with a silicone implant, for example, okay? So all of this I'm explaining because when you come and you tell me the volume, you telling me the cup size, it does help, okay? Because it does help me, and it's not because you wanna be this, what it helps me is the comparison, okay? That you tell me I'm currently a 34C, but I want to be a 34D. Now I am in the same page because what you want is more or less a cup size and augmentation, okay? And a cup size is more or less 100 cc's of implant, okay? So that's that's how I make that, that comparison. But it doesn't help you just tell me I want to be this cup size. It has to be a comparison from your baseline, okay? And the other important thing to, to understand when we're talking about expectations in a breast procedure is that everybody's breasts are different, okay? Like there's no way I can make a breast, a surgical breast that looks exactly like another breast. Whoops, we're okay. <laughs> The reason for that is because your breast tissue is different, the skin elasticity is different, and the shape itself that your body has is different, okay? The width of your chest, um, the concavity of your ribs is different. So it's impossible to make it completely equal. Um, and even though they're like, oh, but I got a breast lift, why I, I don't have that, that upper pole fullness that I wanted, it's because the breast lift relies on your skin, okay? So there are some things that I can surgically tie up with some stitches, but with time, if your skin elasticity is not good and it doesn't have to go, it doesn't doesn't have to directly go with um, the your your specific age, for example, or your history. Sometimes some skins are more lax than others, and that's something genetically predisposed, okay? So the 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 only thing that we can add to try to preserve or lengthen the life or the results of a breast lift breast reduction to be tight and lifted is with what it's called an internal bra mesh okay so it's called galaflex is a mesh that is absorbable that we can add to a breast lift or breast reduction um, and basically creates a scar tissue support in the lower pole of the breast that lengthens the results and it's something that you can consider if that's very important to you not everyone needs it right it's an added benefit to 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 add to a breast lift breast reduction so if you're interested we can discuss it in your consult because i know it, it is an expensive mesh and that's something that i don't put the price to that that's just the company's price uh but i've seen uh, very good results of it especially in the long term okay so let's talk about wound healing. This is the other one that with breast, especially these two, not breast dogs. Breast dogs tend to heal very nicely, but breast lift, breast reduction, expect you may have wound healing problems. Doesn't have to do anything directly with you, uh, but it's just the way of the tension distribution of the breast that puts an extra, extra tension in that T point or that um, the area where the two incisions meet, okay? So that's called the inverted T or triple point is an area that may open up, okay? Don't be scared if you see it, you know, 99.9% .9 of, the, of the open wounds of a, of, a, of, a, of a breast lift or breast reduction, the T point heal, 
just with time. We're just gonna prescribe the antibiotic ointment and that takes and, and that heals on its own, okay? But um, it's a, a cause of anxiety and I understand having an open wound, but the risk of infection with that open wound is very low, okay? Uh, as long as you're putting your antibiotic ointment that I prescribed and changing the gauzes, it just takes time, but it heals on its own and the scar usually heals very nicely, okay? Spitting sutures, that's the other thing that, you know, like the majority of patients experience is spitting sutures and another cause of anxiety that I, I hear a lot of my patients because they don't understand what's going on and they think it's an infection. It is not an infection, don't worry, it's just the sutures, okay? So the sutures I put are absorbable and those sutures uh, I put on the inside, but it takes time, it takes months for the body to absorb them. By the time that the body starts to absorb them, usually two to three months out, the body starts to either absorb it because it breaks it out or it kind of creates like a pimple, like it, it, it engulfs the, the suture and try to pops it out, okay? And that's when you start to see that in the incision and some patients get scared because it looks like a pimple. You start to see like a little red dot that it's um, like, appearing in the edge of the scar it gets tender it may have like a pimple head and then all of a sudden you start to feel like a little suture okay a little knot okay so what you do you clean it with alcohol get a tweezer and just pull it you are not gonna unravel anything okay at that point the incisions are well healed and your body is just getting rid of that suture that doesn't belong there okay so just Take a tweezer, pull it, and it usually other other things like, oh, but I don't want to pull it because I think it's going to hurt. No, it's usually already dissolved. Your body is already dissolving it. You just pull it and you don't even feel it. It's just like taking out like that little piece and it's something very small. You're not going to be pulling like a very long stitch, okay? It's just very small. You pull it and that's it. Afterwards, you can put some mupiracin or bacitracin antibiotic ointment for a day or two by the time that it's closed and that's it. You don't have to do anything else, okay? Sensation changes, okay? So whenever we do incisions, we have, inherently, we cut the nerve endings that are going to the skin, okay? By the time that the body starts to regenerate and heal those nerve endings, those nerve endings start to reconnect and you may experience changes in sensation. It may be pins and needles, it may be like, um, ants crawling, maybe like like um, current like feelings, uh, and all of that is normal. It's not an infection, it's not that your body's rejecting the implant or anything like that, it's just that your body is healing and those nerve endings are growing, okay? What, what are the things that help with this? Usually Benadryl, Claritin, those um, allergy medications help control this. If it gets to the point that, that it's been for a couple of weeks and that is not improving, we can add nerve-related uh, medications like gabapentin and those tend to help with the nerve-related pain. And the other thing to expect after, especially breast lift, breast reduction, it may happen in, in breast augmentation too, is changes in sensation in your nipple areola complex, okay? In a breast augmentation, even if I don't do any incisions around the areola, because of the stretching of the implant, you may feel sensations in the changes in sensation in the nipple. And the breast lift and breast reduction is mainly because of the incision around it. And it can be the two, the two extremes. It can be numb or it can be very sensitive, okay? Usually in a couple of weeks to months, it goes back to normal. In a few percent of patients, that stays that way, okay? Um, and let's talk about pregnancy and breastfeeding. This is a very common um, concern. Uh, so I had a breast reduction 10 years ago and now I want to get pregnant. Can I breastfeed? What's gonna happen to my breast reduction, okay? So with breast um, procedures, uh, the ability to breastfeed may be affected, but the majority of patients are able to successfully breastfeed with implants or breast reductions, okay? So don't think that because you have scars in your breast, you can't. Most patients are able to breastfeed with implants or with scars, even an anchor type of lift, okay? I can say that 100% it's not affected because there has been patients unable to breastfeed, but we don't know if those patients weren't able to breastfeed it in the first place, okay? Um, so 
the end of the day, it may, but the majority, the vast majority of patients, even with implants or breast reduction, breast lift, are able to breastfeed. So I encourage you to try if that is something important to you, to try your breastfeeding journey, even if you had a breast procedure. But with breastfeeding in pregnancy, our breast tissue changes, okay? So the results of your breast procedure may be affected, okay? I'm not saying that you should wait until you finish your your motherhood journey, either like pregnancy, breastfeeding, or whatever, to have your breast pr procedure. But if you're planning on getting pregnant in the next two to three years, then yes, I advise you to wait to have your kids and then have your breast procedure. But if you're 20 years old and have zero plans of when you're having kids, you haven't even, you're not even dating, so you don't know, then you know, have your breast procedure if that's something that it's gonna make you happy and enjoy it. And then if the, the results change with time with pregnancy, then we can take care of that in the future, okay? I get this question a lot, like, should I wait after having kids, but I'm 21 and I don't, I'm, I'm not even dating, I don't even know when I'm gonna have kids. So prioritize what's more important to you at this stage of your life. Uh, and then know that it's a possibility in your decision making, you have to know that if you get pregnant, the results of your cosmetic procedure are going to be affected, are going to change. But also, the results of your procedure may change even with time without getting pregnant. So, you know, it's just a per very personal decision. Uh, so my advice, if it's something that it's in the short run, two to three years, then yes, I advise you to wait. But if it's something that you don't know, it's going to be years from now, you don't even know if you want kids, then, you know, it's, there's, it's not a good reason to just put your life and hold for something that you don't know what's going to happen in the future. Okay. So that's the what to expect. Um, I get to some questions now. Okay. Let's start with this. Is that YouTube? And Hello. Um, she said, my appointment is coming up in two weeks for breast augmentation. I'll that's be awesome. celebrating my birthday in Miami. Can that's I awesome. take off? Oh, oh. Oh, 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 oh. Can I take off? Can I take off? Can I take off the surgical bra for a few hours after a couple of days? So, we can discuss that in person. Uh, it depends on what are you doing for those couple of hours. Uh, so the reason for wearing the surgical bra after your surgery, especially those first six weeks, is the first week specifically is because I want the swelling to be controlled and there's a risk of bleeding. And with tension or pressure from the surgical bra, that kind of controls that those little vessels that may uh, bleed. So that's the importance for the first week. After the first week up to six weeks is to control the scar formation around the implant. So that scar formation around the implant is called the capsule. I want that capsule to form not too big that when you're in in time when you're laying down the implants go to the side so i want that scar to form tight around the implant in a way that your implant settles in it behind the breast tissue and doesn't move in the chest wall too lax okay so we'll talk in details but that's the reason behind the breath the broth this is easy okay hola i want to go and see you soon <laughs> <laughs> Seguro, I'm here. Okay. Come along. <laughs> Another message. We love you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Vidal. Love you too. Thank you okay. for that. Okay. <laughs> this one. Do you do thigh lifts? I do. I do thigh lifts. Thigh lifts is not a very common surgery because the, the recovery and the healing is tough. It's not that um, it's, it's not, I'm, I'm not trying to discourage you if that's something you want. I'm preparing you if that's something that it's really helpful but if you're a massive weight loss patient and you do have a lot of excess skin in the thigh the thigh lift is the best procedure to address that and the patients that do have that skin laxity and that really benefit from the procedure are very happy afterwards it's just that you know you have to know uh what to expect when going into that procedure so you're prepared but usually the the biggest uh the biggest thing is the healing uh, because the thighs is just an area where it's close to the genitals, it's close to um, areas of fold, sweating, it's just a, a difficult area to heal. Doctor, remember the patient about the bra? Yeah. Okay. She's <laughs> going to have dinner because it's her birthday. Okay. So it will be a couple of hours. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And she has again, how long is it? 
typical presentation surgery? The, the surgery itself is less than an hour. Uh, so you're going to be under anesthesia for less than an hour. Um, breast augmentation is a very um, um, tolerable recovery. Uh, majority the, the what to expect with the breast dog in terms of pain is pressure. You're going to feel tight, okay? It's like I'm putting that implant there and stretching uh, the breast tissue so you feel tight. Uh, but other than that, you're going to feel pretty good. Uh, we'll talk about the, the eating. Let's see. Uh, we're going to talk about that when you come in. Do you do fat transfer to the breast? And can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes. So I don't. Uh, the reason why I don't do fat transfer to the breast is mainly two reasons. Okay. I did it. I did it a lot when I was doing breast reconstruction for breast cancer patients because there's no breast tissue in a breast cancer patient. The breast tissue has been removed. Uh, so the combination of an implant with the breast, uh, with the fat transfer is very beneficial. But the problem with adding breast uh, fat tissue to the breast is that afterwards when you're undergoing mammograms for follow up, that new fat that is put may look suspicious, may, may look like cyst. We don't know if it's something that we need to biopsy and then it goes into a spiral of needing to be biopsy, needing to repeat mammograms when it's really nothing. But because we don't know, it may create a lot of anxiety and a lot of returning to mammograms, biopsies, and so on and so forth, okay? That's one of the reasons I don't like to do it in the breast. And the second one is because the fat take, so when I'm when, when we're talking about fat take is how much of the fat that I'm moving from one area to the other survives. In the buttock and hip area, the take or the survival is very good. We're talking about 70 to 80% of the fat that I move survives, okay? And that's pretty good. The reason for that is the blood supply. The blood supply in the buttock and hip is very, it, the, the vessels are very large in the, lower, in the lower part of our torso. In the breast, the vessels are very thin, not as big as in the, in the lower torso. So the blood supply is not very good. So the take or how much of the fat survives is less. We're talking about 40 to 50%. Okay. So majority of patients to see at least one cup size difference need two to three surgeries of fat transfer, fat transfer, fat transfer to see one cup size difference. So I don't think it's worth it to undergo so many surgeries under general anesthesia to try to get one cup size difference with the added complications or, or, or scares of the mammogram. So I prefer not to do it. How long can you still have speeding sutures post-op? Usually you see it in the next few months after surgery, you'll start seeing it at, for example, six weeks to two months after surgery. And usually by six months, everything is fully healed. You may see it up to a year. Those sutures that I've mentioned absorb within six months. So afterwards, you shouldn't be seeing that. Uh, and it's, um, it's, it, you, you won't see that problem with the spinning sutures. Okay. Um... Can you talk a little bit about the recovery for LiPo 360? Of course. Uh, so the recovery of LiPo 360, the majority of the symptoms you are going to experience is related to the removal of fat. Okay. So um, the especially um, the the dizziness, the lightheadedness, the weakness, you're gonna experience that that for the first few days more likely for the first week it's worse the first day and then it gets a little better every day the only way you're going to get better is by hydrating it's like replenishing that fluid that you lost from the fat removal okay um other than that um the the soreness or the discomfort is worse the first two to three days and afterwards the majority of patients are okay with just tylenol I am going to prescribe um, a narcotic for the first day, but usually after two to three days of using the narcotic, you're fully recovered and you're, you're okay with using Tylenol. Um, the the add-on for the recovery is the massages. I think that's one of the most important things um, after the lipo and, and, and BBL case uh, is to get good, good, good massages to get fluid out and contour your skin and your compression, your faja garments. Okay, doctora, a mí se me hizo que lo oídes en mis senos y en la cicatriz del tummy tuck. Okay. ¿Cuánto tiempo debería esperar para hacerme un tratamiento para mejorarlo? Sí. Uh, 
Es una paciente que conozco y es bastante reciente. Ok. Que, creo que está, está muy, muy pronto para decir que es celoide. Sí. Bueno, la, lo que te voy a contestar es que nos escribió por Clara ayer. O sea, rápido nos dice y entonces te podemos decir específicamente de tu caso. Queloides usualmente se forman meses después de la cirugía, ¿verdad? No vamos a empezar a ver queloides por lo menos hasta las seis semanas, dos meses, uh, más o menos. Y no, no vas a ver eso. Primero vas a ver lo que se llama una hipertrófica, una cicatriz hipertrófica, que la cicatriz se empieza a poner un poquito más gruesa. Un queloide es cuando el, ese tejido de cicatriz está más grueso que la incisión original. Ahí es que le llamamos queloide. Cuando está simplemente grueso, pero del mismo tamaño de la incisión, eso se llama una cicatriz hipertrófica. ¿Qué cositas hacemos para tratar de mejorar eso? Unos masajes, ¿ok? Esto tú lo puedes hacer en tu casa cuando te estás poniendo el tratamiento de cicatriz, que es lo segundo más importante. Así que te vas a hacer los masajes mientras que te estás poniendo el tratamiento de cicatriz con, 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 la, con el gel, ¿ok? Es el, el gel de silicona te lo vas a aplicar y a ese punto, si ya tenemos cicatrices hipertróficas, no te lo vas a romper, no te vas a abrir la herida, así que puedes hacer una presión, una presión moderada a severa encima de la cicatriz para irla suavizando, ¿ok? Si ya está muy gruesa, pues hay otras alternativas como son inyecciones con quenalo, que es un esteroide para mejorar la cicatriz, o eh, otra, otro medicamento que se llama florobrasil, el 5-FU, que son medicamentos para ir rompiendo la cicatriz. Eso todo va a depender del de grado de hipertrofia que tenga la cicatriz. Y otras opciones a largo plazo es los lasers. Los lasers también son muy buenos para ir rompiendo esa cicatriz y hacerla más clara y, y menos eh, gruesa. Este, y siempre, si ninguna de estas cosas funciona, podemos hacer una revisión de la cicatriz, que es quirúrgicamente removerla. <risa> Me pareció que Gisela se sí. hizo algo de transferencia de grasa a las mejillas. Sí. ¿Entendí mal o es posible hacer eso? Es posible, no entendiste mal, eh, entendiste muy bien. Eh, transferencia a, a la cara de grasa se puede hacer. La transferencia que se hace es bien mínima, así que no tiene que ser con, con una, una liposucción mayor, pero yo hago las liposucciones bajo anestesia general. Así que siempre que, si vienes para, por ejemplo, un mommy makeover, si vienes para un BBL, si vienes para una lipo 360, es algo que se puede añadir al procedimiento. No lo hago solito porque te tengo que hacer la lipo, tengo que sacar la grasa para poder transferirla. Este, y básicamente la grasa funciona como un filler, como el filler de ácido, ácido hialurónico, eh, pero al ser tu grasa, pues es más duradera. Donde se pone, pues en las áreas más o menos donde se ponen también los, los fillers o los rellenos de ácido hialurónico, más comúnmente en las mejillas, en el sulco nasolabial, eh, en el área este, también del mentón, en el área de, de, de la, del mentón aquí en el centro, todas esas áreas, en los labios se puede también rellenar. Y si, si eres una paciente que viene para un facelift, es un área, es, es una combinación bien buena para hacer. Cuando haces el facelift, que se estira y se remueve todo el exceso de piel y luego se rellena con un poquito de grasa y queda bien rejuvenecida la cara, el rostro. And the last one. Yes. Hello, Dr. Viral. Um, this is a BBL question. Can I sleep on my side, although no fat was transferred to the hips, but only the glute area? Mm, so... I would advise not to, okay? When you are sleeping on your side, even if you're not putting pressure to the buttock, the the tension or or the or or like the gravity taking effect on the on the buttock is gonna cause displacement, okay? So I prefer that you sleep in your belly and that way that has an even tension and pressure on your buttock and nothing shifting to the sides, okay? Awesome you guys, thank you so much for the questions. I will do next week the what to expect on breast implants. So we dedicate the time to breast, talking about breast implants. And if you have any questions or any topics you want me to discuss, send me a DM and we'll get to it. I'll see you guys next week on Tuesday Tips. Take care.